Uh, if you'll please join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. While you do that, Father God, we thank you for the place you've given us to meet. We thank you for the love that you have for us. Thank you for your word. It comforts. It encourages. It exhorts. It corrects. It instructs in righteousness. And it is forever true. Thank you for the pure word of God that we need. And I'm not the teacher. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. So please give us the gift of teaching that we'd understand this chapter. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week we finished 1 Corinthians chapter 1 with an exhortation to not trust in ourselves. We are flawed and we are finite. Don't trust in ourselves in the midst of a trial. We can only get what we can do. But rather we're to trust in the almighty, infinite God and to trust in what it is that he can do. Uh, and we're to follow him day by day. We're only given one day at a time. Uh, we're given to follow him with simplicity and godly sincerity, reading, acknowledging the word of God as it directs our paths in our walk with him to the end. And along the way, we need help. And so it's always available. And we get help when we want it and ask for it. He's always there. And now this time in chapter 2, we're going to consider a, a sweet fragrance, perhaps the sweetest fragrance that there is. Now, I don't know if you husbands are out there shopping for perfumes for your wives or not, but uh, there's no better fragrance than this one. Give her this one. Uh, this has to do with repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. And so we start in verse 1 of chapter 2. And what we have to, you know, just to set the baseline for this. We have all sinned against God. Every last one of us. We all live in glass houses. So we're not to be picking up stones and throwing at anybody else. The word of God is given to us to show us our Father in heaven, to show us our Lord Jesus Christ and to reveal things in our own heart. Uh, we have all wronged someone along the way in our life, and we've all been wronged by someone along the way. And so this chapter is to be received personally by each of us, uh, and I pray that you would just be focused on your own heart, your own walk, as we consider what God has to, to say to us uh, in this chapter, starting in verse 1. But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? Uh, context, let's go back up to chapter 1, verse 17. When he wrote, when I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness or the things that I purposed? Do I purpose according to the flesh that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? The Apostle Paul planted a church in Corinth. Uh, he ministered to them in person, house to house, and in, as a fellowship. He wrote them a letter. Uh, they had issues. They're a very carnal church. And he's saying to them, did I use lightness? Did I use levity in instructing you in righteousness? No. He had some very heavy things to say to them. And by, of course, the power of the Holy Spirit inspiring him, he said it quite directly. And those things produced some sadness and heartache in the church. But did he write that letter according to his flesh or by the power of the Holy Spirit? It was by the Spirit. Uh, did he try to navigate the, the winds of doctrine that were swir swirling through the church? No, he stood on our firm foundation, the rock that cannot be moved. Uh, and toward that end, he will write to the church at Ephesus. If you join me in Ephesians chapter 4, this was his heart to the Corinthian church as well, not just to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4. 
uh, starting in verse 11, and he gave, this is Jesus giving to his bride, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ in his office, in his calling, and with that purpose, that mind and heart, the Apostle Paul wrote a pretty firm letter to the church at Corinth. Uh, now back to first Corinth, or excuse me, Second Corinthians, also for context, chapter 1 again, verse 24. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand. Uh, the Apostle Paul didn't use levity where directness was used or was required, nor did he turn a blind eye, an uncaring eye, to all the errors that were in that church. He loved them enough to confront them with love. And in so doing, he helped them according to their need. What did they need? They needed chastisement. They needed correction, lovingly given. And now here we are, he's visited them again for the second time, he's left them, and now he's writing yet a second letter to them, and he's decided here in chapter two, verses one, uh, that he's not gonna write another heavy letter. <laughs> but he's going to yet again help them according to their need. And what is it that they need now? Edification and comfort. See, Paul was saddened, he was grieved. He was distressed about a situation in the church that is recorded for us in 1 Corinthians chapter five, where a man was fornicating with his father's wife, not his mother, but his father's wife. And the church accepted the behavior, didn't rebuke the behavior, but rather accepted it in the name of grace. They thought they were being gracious. Well, he rebuked the man, he rebuked the church for not instructing him in righteousness, and he instructed them to deliver that man to Satan, meaning disfellowship him, show him the door, let him go out into the world where he wants to live, and let the Lord deal with him out there. And in so doing, purge the sin from the camp, the leaven that was in the church, which is a pretty tough message. Uh, but what they do in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14, it says, as ye also have acknowledged to us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord. What did the church at Corinth do with this heavy letter that they received from the apostle Paul? Uh, by faith, they received it, and they obeyed what he instructed them to do. Even though it caused them great distress to do it, they did it. And as a result of their obedience to the Holy Spirit, the man repented. What was the motive of this heavy letter? Uh, it was God's love. What was the purpose? to bring repentance and to bring restoration, to bring that man back into the fellowship when he repented. And God's word went forth and it did not come back void and it accomplished what pleased him and now the Lord, uh, the, the Apostle Paul is, is rejoicing. You know, when we, by faith, and by submission to the Lord who cleansed us from all our sins with his blood and thereby purchased us, when we obey what he says, it yields the fruit of repentance and the acknowledging of the truth. Those things are very, very pleasing. That's 
fruit that's pleasing to the Father. Uh, this man, he wanted help. He was disfellowshipped. And he found himself in a place where he wanted help. And he asked for help. And he got help. And the Apostle Paul is rejoicing in what the Lord did in that man's life. Verse 3. And I wrote the same unto you, lest, when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. The first letter was after his first visit. And he says, I don't want to come to you again with that heaviness. Uh, after all, you're my spiritual children, and I am the father in the faith to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he wrote to them, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For through you, excuse me, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. He, I'm, I'm like a spiritual father. I'm not your Lord. I don't have dominion over you. I'm a helper of your joy. I, I'm your spiritual father. You're my spiritual children, if you will. I shouldn't be distressed about you. I should be rejoicing in your midst. I don't want this heartache. I want to rejoice. And, and so he loved them enough to lovingly speak of the help that they needed rather than saying things that they would like to hear or by just ignoring the whole situation to begin with. Uh, and that letter, the first letter, was a, a tear-stained letter. Uh, who knows how long he anguished? Who knows the depth of his distress? But as he recorded the words the Holy Spirit gave him, he cried over those letters, over those words. And nonetheless, he sent the letter, they received the letter, and the Lord worked with, through the Apostle Paul with much affliction and anguish of heart, with many tears, displaying the heart and the mind of our Father in heaven and having the love of a shepherd for his flock, motivated by the agape love of God, the whole purpose was repentance and reconciliation to disfellowship and then through the repentance and reconciliation to restore the one to fellowship. Verse 5. But if, have, if any have caused grief, he's not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. The Apostle Paul, uh, was he holier than thou? Well, once, a time, once upon a time he was. Back when he was known as Saul, Saul of Tarsus, he was holier than thou. And he failed in the relationship with God. And of course he came to understand that. And I, I believe for the rest of his life, it was never far from his mind, his own failures and his own sins that had been forgiven. I mean, he consented, was a cheerleader even, for the death of an innocent and a righteous man. Stephen, he held the coat so people get a good wing at him, throwing their rocks. Uh, he made havoc of the church, breaking and entering into the homes of the followers of Jesus Christ and hauling them off to prison, charging them with blasphemy. He was breathing out threatening and slaughter to the disciples of the Lord. He zealously hunted down people, called, people who God called righteous. He called them vile criminals. He was a persecutor of the church. He was a persecutor of Jesus Christ, and he was called on it. <laughs> he was confronted in a loving way with his own sin, and he repented. And there was a reconciliation between him and God as a result. And so now with 
that I think never far from his mind, he is suffering on behalf of what he sees in Corinth. Uh, he, and it, it's not a self-righteous sorrow or condemnation. It's, it's a righteous one. He's broken hearted about what they're, they were doing. What they needed was correction. They needed chastisement. He knew those things so well. He knew, but he also knew it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And he, he knows that personally in his own life. And now this man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he does too. After the, the godly chastisement of disfellowship, uh, he's come back. He's repented. It did what God intended it to do. Praise the Lord, right? Now what? Verse 7. So that contrarywise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him. Thus perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with much over, over much sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. The man has been confronted with his sin against God. And he's repented. So now the ministry of the church in his life is to forgive him. To comfort him, to restore fellowship with him, and to love him as the Father loves him. And make sure that he knows, not just lip service, show him that you love him. Matthew, in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught us, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness, that's the heart of God. Unforgiveness, that's the heart of the devil. Unforgiveness is sin. Unforgiveness itself must be repented of. Uh, Jesus also taught us that blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive Mercy. Well, if I don't get mercy, I get justice. I don't want justice. I don't want what I deserve. I, I, that's mercy, not getting what I deserve. You, you don't want to get what you deserve? Well, then be merciful, as the Father in heaven is merciful. Uh, James wrote us in chapter 2 that he shall, God will have judgment without mercy for those who have not shown mercy. He delights in mercy. His children are to be as he is, merciful. In chapter 1 of the book we're reading, speaking of God, our Father, the God of all comfort, who's comforted us, and through us, he were to comfort others. We have an, a ministry of comfort. And he's calling upon the church at Corinth here to exercise their ministry of comfort, lest this man's faith gets shipwrecked and that which should happen, the restoration of fellowship, is destroyed. Because what does God want us to do? What, is, what does our Father want us all to do? Jesus said before he went to the cross, I give you one commandment. What was the one commandment? Love each other as I have loved you. If you love me, if you, me, if you love each other the way I love you, the world will know that you're my disciples. Uh, they're being called to do just that. Verse nine, for to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. The first letter with much affliction, tear stained. It was a letter of correction and chastisement. This letter, the second letter, is a letter of forgiveness and comfort and love. And the church at Corinth, they received the first letter. It, it caused them anguish, but they, by faith, received it. They did what they were instructed to do. Paul's saying, I, I believe you'll do the very same thing with this letter. Verse 10, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. 
For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know that phrase there, but by the grace of God go I? We should all own that because it's true. Uh, I, no doubt the Apostle Paul, he owned it. And so he has done to the repentant man of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 what the Lord has done to that man. And what has the Lord done? Forgiven him. He repented. He is forgiven. And who is the Lord? Oh, he's the one who bore all of Saul of Tarsus's sin, and he bore all of this man's sin, and he bore all of my sins, and he bore all of our sins. And if he's forgiven him, who are you guys to not forgive him? Who am I to not forgive him? With the chastisement of being confronted in a loving way of his sin and being disfellowshipped, uh, the man of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 received a gift from the Lord, the gift of repentance. And by faith, he received it. And he put it on display. He did the works worthy of repentance. He turned from the, the world. He turned back to the Lord and resumed his walk with him who had purchased him. So, who am I? As a, we embrace these things personally. Who am I to not forgive someone whom the Lord has forgiven? given the fact that he removed the filth of all my sin by the blood of Jesus Christ, who am I not to forgive anyone for anything? If we don't forgive, we're not forgiven. If we don't forgive, something happens. Bitterness. Our corporate reading, bitterness happens. Satan's a, a liar. We're not ignorant of him. We're not ignorant of how he operates. How does he operate? Well, he's a liar. He's a slanderer. He's the author of strife and envy and confusion and doubt and division, the purpose of which is to destroy. And that's accomplished in our hearts when we don't forgive as we have been forgiven. That bitterness is a poison. It ends up being a self-inflicted wound, a very grievous self-inflicted wound that results in a lot of dominoes around us falling. It's a real terrible thing. And so for the health and the unity of the fellowship. Now, unforgiveness, it, it being a, a poison, it poisons our relationship with the Lord. It poisons our relationship with people around us. Uh, that results in not only a a health issue for our relation, it results in a health issue for our physical being, for our emotional being. It's bad news. <laughs> it's very bad news. So for the health of ourselves, for the health of our families, for the health of the church, we need to forgive as much as we've been forgiven. Not a skosh, not even a skoshless. Every bit as much as we've been forgiven, we must forgive. We must be as merciful as the Lord has been to us. And we must continually grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that sweet fragrance, that's unlike any other fragrance in the world, of repentance and forgiveness and restoration. May it fill our hearts. May it fill our homes and our places where we gather and the places that we move about day to day. Uh, so vitally important. Verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Uh, Paul's going to elaborate on this fragrance uh, as he speaks of 
the personal experience in his second missionary journey, which you can read about in Acts chapter 16 and 17. It's when the Lord opened a door for him to preach the gospel. He was in the Roman province of Asia, modern day Turkey. He wanted to go there, he wanted to go there. The Holy Spirit closed the doors. Finally, a vision appeared to Paul in the night and there was a man of Macedonia speaking to him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. The Lord who opens doors no man can close and closes doors no man can open had opened a door to the gospel to a different continent the European continent. And the first Roman province there was Macedonia. And so Paul obeyed. That wasn't exactly where he wanted to go, but that's where the, the door was open. When the door opens, you walk through it by faith, not knowing what's there. Well, led by the Spirit, the Apostle Paul bore much spiritual fruit. Started with a, a woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, and her household came to faith in Jesus Christ. Gentiles. Then it, he went to the city of Philippi, the primary city in that Roman province. And there was a damsel with a demon whom he cast out and the owners of this servant raised a ruckus. And so Paul and his gang got thrown into prison. And the Philippian jailer and his family came to Christ. He was the man he saw in the vision, come to Macedonia and help us. What must I do to be saved? That was his plea. I'll believe on Jesus Christ. And he was released. And there he went to Thessalonica, and then from there he went to Berea. And he suffered in Thessalonica, and he suffered in Berea. Much spiritual fruit, all of which came with some much suffering also. But as a result, there were fellowships of followers of Jesus Christ in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. Now, the door was open to preach the gospel. Paul was faithful to preach the gospel. Who heard the gospel? Uh, everyone who heard his voice. Did they all believe? No. No. Did the Lord knock on every heart that heard Paul's voice? Yes. Did everyone hear that knock and open their heart to the Lord? No, they didn't. Verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor, the fragrance, of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? There were some who opened their heart when they heard the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins, which means we're sinners, that there's none that are righteous, no, not one. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Our righteousness is like a filthy rag. We must be, the gospel confronts us with our sin. And some run, some are drawn. Some hear the knock on their heart and open wide. Come in, help me. Others start battening down the hatches. They want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. But those who responded by faith the father it was the father drawing them to jesus christ whosoever would believe was drawn by the father to his son and in turn the son presented them to his father they believed on him they heard his words and they passed from condemnation and death unto justification and life so there was a lot of faithful labor unto the Lord, and there was a lot of suffering for that labor, but it resulted in victory. Even if one repented, Paul would have been sent. But many were in Philippi, in Thessalonica, and Berea. The victory of having comfort and salvation, being reconciled unto God. 
repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation. A sweet fragrance of God is knowing Jesus and making him known. And Jesus, of course, is, you know, the volume of the book is written of him. We read of a, a sweet savor, a sweet fragrance that is Jesus. It was foretold. There were shadows of that in the Old Testament in their offerings. A sweet savor unto the Lord. Who's oh, speaking of Jesus? For those who believed, who heard that they were sinners, yet God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. For those who believed repented, they were forgiven and they were redeemed. Not only did they agree intellectually, they agreed practically. The way I'm living my life is contrary, is offensive to God. I don't want to offend the God who purchased me, the maker of heaven and earth, the word of God that became flesh and dwelt amongst. No, I'm going to turn and live a different way. I'm going to live according to his boundaries, within his boundaries. They were forgiven. They were redeemed. And to them, the sweet fragrance of Jesus was life. But not all did. Some Maybe many, or even most, did not believe. They said, nah, that's nonsense. I'm fine. I'm good. It's all good between me and God. And they remained defiant. Didn't change their lifestyle. Kept living the way they were living. And therefore, they were not forgiven. And they're not redeemed. And to them... The very sweet fragrance of Jesus smelled like death. But we're told in James there's one lawgiver who is able to both save and to destroy. We're kind of determined on our judgment of that fragrance. That fragrance of Jesus, is it like life? I need that, I want that, I want to smell like that? Or is it death? Oof, got to get out of this place. But it's only one gospel. It's, there's only one true gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace. The same gospel, the very same fragrance. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and he was buried and raised again on the third day, according to the scriptures. But there's two radically different responses to that fragrance. Well, if we... <laughs> smell Jesus and we smell life and we embrace the life and we follow Jesus, what should we then do? We should smell like Jesus. True? And, and, and therein lies some very basic and very simple relationship counsel for every husband, every wife, every father, every mother, every grandfather, every grandmother, every child, Every friend here. What's that relationship advice? Smell like Jesus. <laughs> Put on that Jesus perfume. Not just a little dab. Bathe in it. Smell like Jesus. And that's not just with the people we love. That's wherever we go. And we're sent out into the world to smell like Jesus, and some people are going to smell life and be drawn, and some people are going to smell death and run. We're not responsible for how they smell Jesus, but we are responsible to make sure that they do smell Jesus. And so somehow, the Lord needs to become a part of our conversations. And, and to some, They'll smell life and they'll, they'll want more and, and many, maybe even most, will smell death and they'll run away. That's between them and the Lord. What's between us and the Lord is to smell like Jesus. How's that possible without the indwelling and empowering Spirit of Christ? It's impossible 
because he is our righteousness. Without him, we have our own righteousness, and that's a, that smells like death. I guarantee you that smells like death. We need the Holy Spirit. Verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. At the end of the first chapter, he says, I'm the helper of your joy. Paul stands uncompromisingly on the word of God. He doesn't add to it. He doesn't take away from it. He doesn't dilute it. But he speaks it lovingly, with sincerity, as one of God's children before God and men. As God is my witness, these things are true. And he is saying to the Corinthian church, I, as God is my witness, this is all so true. But there are many false teachers. There are many winds of doctrine which corrupt the pure word of God. Teachers or doctrine that add or take away or dilute the word of God. Teachers who pick and choose what they believe to be true in the Bible, thereby making themselves judges of the Bible. Uh, teachers with another gospel. Perhaps it's the social gospel. Humanism is the base. Or it's the prosperity gospel. Mammon is the base. Or the love gospel. God loves everybody, so everybody's going to heaven. Or it's the works gospel. I'm going to heaven if I do enough good works, and I'm not exactly sure what they are. I'm not sure how much I have to do, but that's, that's the truth. There's lots of false gospels. There's only one true one. And these false teachers have a tendency to make merchandise of God's people, to somehow enrich themselves with the deception that they're selling. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They say perverse things in order to draw disciples unto themselves. Paul's saying, I'm not like that. Be followers of me, because I'm following Jesus. I'm smelling like Jesus. He died for my sins. I am a new creature in Christ. I'm not as I was. No, and he's not even done with me yet. He's still working in me. So the gospel of Jesus Christ and we're, we're just weeks away from celebrating the incarnation. Emmanuel, God with us. Why? Fundamental question, why did God come to be with us? Because mankind had a problem called death. But mankind could not solve the problem but mankind needed to solve the problem. Now, God could solve the problem. So what did God do? Became man to solve man's problem for whosoever would trust him instead of themselves. That's pretty basic. That's pretty simple. That's pretty amazing. That's a sweet fragrance. That's the sweet fragrance of God. Repentance by the sinner when confronted with their sin against a holy God. And when a, agreement and turning comes the forgiveness of God and the restoration, the reconciliation of a relationship back into the family of God. The motive for the gospel is the supernatural love of God who commended, who demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say, clean up your act, get spotless, and I'll welcome you into the family. He said, no, you're a filthy mess. Let me clean you up. I'll make you a new kind. I'll make you one of my children. It's his work, it's not ours. It's his heart, not ours. It's his love, it's not ours. What is ours is to repent and as his people forgive those who have been forgiven by him and to be reconciled unto those who have been reconciled unto him. To not hold grudges, 
You know, Keith, you said it's the hardest thing uh, sometimes for people to do is to forgive. Why? Because Jesus isn't the Lord. I'm the Lord. And I decide when someone's going to be forgiven. Well, obviously that's a corrupt standpoint. As much as I have been forgiven, I am to forgive. And, and what have I been forgiven of? Uh, everything. Everything. So, forgiveness is like mercy. As much as we receive, we're to give. Uh, and that's a, a sweet, sweet fragrance in a world that is a trash heap. So, just considering this chapter, uh, have you, you know, let's just examine ourselves here. Um, have I done God wrong? Or have I done somebody else wrong? Per this chapter, in the context of scripture, what should I do? I should do what the man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 did. I should receive by faith God's chastisement and with it, his gift of repentance. And I should put it on display in my life. Corrective action, known as repentance. I should be as that man. I should want the help of God. I should ask for the help of God. And then I should submit and obey the help that God gives to me. Well, what if somebody has done me wrong? What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to do what the church of Corinth is being instructed to do. And that is to be quick to forgive unless the wound that is in my heart turns to bitterness and defiles me and everyone around me. Forgive. Does that mean it's conditional? Is forgiveness conditional? No, it's unconditional. Well, I'm not going to forgive unless they repent. Is that biblical? It's not biblical. We forgive. And then we wait patiently with our arms open wide for God to work in that person's heart and for corrective action to be seen. And then me having forgiven and them having repented, what comes of that? The restoration of a relationship. Repentance, forgiveness results in comfort and love and restoration. And that's why God came, to restore a bunch of filthy creatures that he loved so much by changing from within their hearts and their minds. So we are now witnesses and ambassadors of that work. And therefore, at home, always first at home, smell like Jesus. Then when you leave the home and you go to work, smell like Jesus. When you go to the grocery store, smell like Jesus. The fragrance of God is to know Jesus and make him known. It's the sweetest fragrance there is. Anybody want some of that? Yeah. Okay, if you'd stand with me, please. Father, we stand before you. And I pray, because I don't know what's going on in anybody's life. I don't know their hearts. Scripture says, I don't even know mine. It's deceitful and desperately wicked. That I know. And I know that we struggle with our flesh. And that there's a, a battle raging inside all of us. The spirit against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And sometimes we feed the flesh and we smell like death. <laughs> sometimes we feed the spirit and we smell like life 
But I'm pretty sure that myself and everybody else here would be grateful for the gift of repentance, that we would receive it by faith, that we would actually hear that you're confronting us with sin that's still in our lives. And you have something so much better for us if we would just stop and turn and follow you. May we all receive the gift of repentance. If anyone's done us wrong, may we be quick to forgive, as quick as we want to be forgiven. May we be merciful as much as we want mercy. You've begun a good work in us. You're going to be faithful to finish it. In the meantime, Lord, help us to seek your will and not our own. And your will is, we smell like Jesus. Please pour out your spirit upon us that we do. At home, at work, in our communities, wherever we go. We understand some will think we smell like life and some will think that we smell like death and some of those people might even be in our own families. But we, we keep our eyes on you. We thank you for loving us. We don't deserve it. But that's you. That's your nature. That's your heart. We want 